Welcome to the History of English podcast, a podcast about the history of the English language. This is a short bonus episode and something a little different. Obviously, I don't normally do interviews for the podcast, but I recently had a chance to speak with Alan Metcalf about his latest book called The Life of Guy. Now, if you're a fan of the history of English, you may be familiar with Alan's work. He's written several books about language and the history of English. He's a professor of English at McMurray College in Illinois, and he was also the executive secretary of the American Dialect Society until his retirement last year. Now, as I noted, he's written several books about the history of English and English words. And his latest book explores the fascinating history of the word guy. It's an extremely common word in the language today. We routinely say things like, look at that guy, and hey guys. It's even become a common pronoun in many people's speech. We use it to distinguish singular you from plural you when we say you guys, as in, hey, what are you guys doing? So the word guy has essentially become a generic word for a person or a group of people. And it's so common that we might assume it's a very old word, but it isn't. It's first recorded in English documents in the 1800s, so it's actually a very modern word. In fact, it's derived from the name of a specific person. There was actually a guy named Guy who gave us the word Guy. He was a very controversial figure. In fact, he was really a terrorist, and he lived in the early 1600s. Professor Metcalf's book traces that history from this shadowy figure to the modern word Guy. And since it mixes political and social and linguistic history, I thought it would be a great topic for the podcast. So I recently spoke with Professor Metcalf by phone, and we talked about the book and the evolution of the word Guy. Again, the book is called The Life of Guy, Guy Fox, The Gunpowder Plot, and The Unlikely History of an Indispensable Word. <laughs> In the podcast, I like to explore the intersection of political history and social history and linguistic history, and no word exemplifies those connections better than the word guy. Uh, it's a word that actually began its life as the name of a political figure in England in the early 1600s, uh, a very notorious political figure. So who was that first guy who you know gave us the word guy? Well, his full name was Guy Fox. He was from York, England, but he had been a soldier on the continent for quite a while. He was a gentleman, but he also was a terrorist. There was a group of 13 Catholics who were part of the many attempts to overthrow the Protestant government of England in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. And it, uh, the, the year was actually 1605, and Guy Fox was well, the leader of the group, had the ingenious idea of just blowing up the Houses of Parliament to get rid of all of the Protestant, not only uh, lords and commons, but also the head of the chief clergy and quite a bit of royalty. And that way, then, presumably, um, Catholics would rise up and seize control of England, and we go back to the Catholic faith, just as it had been before Henry VIII in the previous century, decided to make himself head of the Church. And Guy Fox was, he wasn't the ringleader, but he was chosen to light the fire. They had stored 36 barrels of gunpowder under the House of Parliament, taking about a year to do that. They were pretty, cause this was in downtown London, and they had 36 barrels, and Guy Fox was an expert on explosives. And so on the eve of the 5th of November, 1605, he was there with his boots on, ready to run away, but also with the matches and the fuse. And it just happened that a search party sent by the uh, Royal Authority happened to notice this guy with matches, and they thought he was rather suspicious. So they arrested him and brought him immediately to King James himself, and 
he didn't have much to say, but he was the first one of the conspirators who was caught, and subsequently he was tortured. He gave some names, and he, like all the others, were put to death. But Guy Fox is remembered because he's the guy who was ready to blow up the Houses of Parliament. I think a lot of people in in America may not be as familiar with the name, but they may be familiar with a mask that's become very popular, what's known as the Guy Fawkes mask. It, uh, I guess, has its origins in a book and then later a movie, but it's the mask that sort of looks like a hockey mask uh, with a smiling face and a wide mustache curled up at the ends with a, a thin goatee or strip of hair on the chin. That mask is intended to represent Guy Fawkes, uh, and and you know ultimately his role in this gunpowder plot. So, how was he perceived in the aftermath of that plot? Was he? I assume he was considered a villain at the time. Well, he was considered a villain, and again, his particular actions, being ready to blow up the Houses of Parliament, were particularly shocking. And what was even more amazing was that. He was caught just before starting to do it, and to make sure that, well, to make sure that they were grateful for it, um, the houses, the House of Parliament, the, the Houses of Parliament in early 1606 declared that henceforth every November 5th would be a holiday, and at that holiday it would first be a, a mandatory church service, thanking God for delivering England from this terrible uh, plot. And secondly, that evening, they would have bonfires and fireworks. In a way, they would be doing what Guy Fox didn't manage to do. And since it was every November 5th, and even though there were also the Pope and other characters were um, vilified there, it was always Guy Fox because, as, as the story was told, Guy was the guy in front. So that is how he how he be became and remains famous, and that's also how his name took a strange path that it did. So the celebrations were really not not celebrating Guy Fox, but celebrating the discovery of the plot, and, and he actually got very close. I mean, they really discovered the plot right on the eve of the, of the explosion, the, the gunpowder and everything was already in place, so that was really sort yeah. of caught at the last second. And so it was really the, I guess, the celebration of the discovery of that plot. But that's also, I think, I think you outlined this in the book, is how we start to get the evolution from Guy as a name to Guy as more of a generic noun, uh, the, the effigies that were burned during those bonfires. It's, yes, they had the effigies, I think, like stuff with straw or whatever. And... They would celebrate the defeat of Guy Fox by tossing his effigy in the fire. And after a while, they'd call it the guy. They really got the guy and so on. And then, and this is over a period of oh, four, well, 400 years from then until now, um, gradually the term guy began to be used to refer to a person, uh, to you know, this guy here, that guy there. At first, it was a very negative term, you wouldn't want to be called a guy because that means you were low class, uh, dirty, I don't know, just the kind of person that would be sort of the uh, bottom of the scale. But then gradually, strangely enough, and this is another century's developing, and it developed especially in America as well as in England, um, but we're focusing our attention on America now because that's how this present day thing developed. And it also then began to be used to mean someone who was unusually fastidious or foppish in his dress. So again, not necessarily a compliment, but um, you know, a, a dude or a dandy or something like that. Not the most terrible term. And then, I'm not sure why, but I can sort of guess, it, granted, it began to extend its meaning to the point where a guy can mean any male. And I think one of the reasons is that we are happy to have generic terms, and aside from the one we, from Guy that we have now, uh, there isn't, it's hard to find a single word that encompasses all of the males. 
just as it's even more difficult to have a single word that encompasses all females. So a major 20th century development was that guy was any guy. So it seems to me that uh, the, the American Revolution actually played a role in this because it seems as if the name guy lost some of its stigma after that as Americans started to become less familiar with the character of Guy Fawkes and it, it just sort of becomes more of a generic word within American English. Do you think that that played a role or had it was a factor in the evolution in American English? Yes, because pretty soon since America didn't have a Guy Fawkes night, or at least not nationwide, a few places did, um, the, the name Guy Fawkes I think Guy Fox wasn't so well known. Also, of course, Guy tried to overthrow the, the government of England. Uh, we tried to, maybe not overthrow, but at least to defy the government of England also. So it wasn't quite as terrible a thing from that perspective. But it is important that the origin or the original name of the villain gradually drifted from our consciousness. And that allowed Guy to be any guy. And then, of course, the the most amazing thing of all, and it determined me to write the book, was that nowadays, Guy means a man, mostly, a male of some sort. But you guys, the plural, has become, for many of us, our standard second-person plural plural pronoun. So uh, we'd say, hey, you guys, come over here. And the really interesting thing is that it's not just males. So you can say, I've seen a number of instances where one female addresses a group of females saying, you guys. Well, I want to explore that a little bit more because I think it's very important. Uh, you know, we in the podcast, we've explored the evolution of pronouns. And I think anyone that's listened to the podcast series will know that at one time in the, in the, you know, the more distant past, we used thou and thee for singular address, second person, right. singular pronouns. Uh, you was really just the plural form, also used, I guess, in more formal context. If you were speaking to an individual of higher status, you wanted to be more formal, you could use you. But over time, thee and thou fell out of the language. And that happened, I guess, sort of in conjunction with the evolution of the word guy, so that by the time we get into the 1700s and certainly into the 1800s, we're using the word you for both plural you know, and singular address, which is a problem because we no longer have a way to distinguish singular and plural. So we're looking for other right. alternatives now. Of course, we have you all and in the South we have y'all, but then you guys, as you mentioned, starts to evolve. I guess that was initially primarily a Northern feature, Northern American speech in the Northeast. Is is that where it began? Well, it's, um, I've had some evidence of people from California too, but yes, it's the the non-South parts of the United States. And one of the other things that was striking about it is that nobody kind of noticed. I mean, they didn't, There are some changes in usage that have editors and teachers and whatnot up in arms saying, no, don't ever say such and such. But for some reason, Guy just kind of crawled under the radar. And so uh, around the 1940s was when it was really catching on. I know that's what I say myself. I grew up in Chicago, and that's what you just say. Hey, you guys. And even if I were a female and had a group of females, I, would, I might very well say, hey, you guys. Um, or if I did, it, it wouldn't be that notable. But I think that the one reason that we do you say you guys is that it's comprehensive. It's uh, global. It, every human being is a guy. Um, men and boys, women and girls, but also every kind of LGBTQ and whatnot, everyone is a guy. So if you're addressing a group of guys, a group of people, more than one, then you can say you guys without worrying about what particular uh, gender identity they have or anything else. But we do have this fascinating distinction, which you alluded to earlier, which is when we use the word guy in reference to an individual, 
it still seems to have its you know be restricted to a masculine sense. So in other words, if we saw a woman walking down the street, we wouldn't say, you know, who's that guy? You know, individually, it seems to be limited to men or, or boys. But when we have a group, whether it be all men, all women or mixed, we can use guys plural. Uh, I, I can't really think of another word that does that. Maybe the word man in its traditional sense, we can refer you know, to mankind has a, a more generic sense. Uh, and we refer to all men are created equal kind of you know, has a, a, a generic right. sense, but we wouldn't refer to a woman as a man. So it, there seems to be some parallel there. Do you, do you have any thoughts about that? And maybe maybe the future of the word guy, is it will it continue to ha- maintain that distinction? Or in the future, do you think that uh, people will refer to an individual female as a guy? Well, there are occasional citations, even nowadays, of someone saying, well, she's quite a guy, mm-hmm. uh, not meaning that she's a man, but um, it's very difficult to, I don't see that kind of trend I don't see it not coming, but guy in the singular is so definitely associated with being male, and uh, and you guys is for a lot of us very definitely associated with being whatever, and it is a very curious situation. I think you have a good example in man there, but it's even more I don't know more blatant or whatever. Mm-hmm. I should I should mention that. Yes, in the development of the pronouns of English, there are other European languages also, which originally, like 2,000 years ago, had a plural like you and a singular like thou. And then English, like so many of the others, began uh, using the plural as a more polite form. Uh, so you could have a, you could say, talk, say you to a single person showing your respect. But for some reason, in, in England, unlike in other languages, thou and thee and thy completely eventually dropped out over many centuries. It was kind of around the 18th century when it really disappeared. And some people say it was because the... the, the uh, who are the... Puritans? The Quakers. Quakers. The Quakers. Yeah, the Quakers made a point of using only thee and thou for for one person, because the Quakers didn't think that any person should be elevated above others. And so using the and thou became associated with being uh, a Quaker, which a lot of people weren't. Maybe that was the last step that really got rid of it. So that's a gaping hole in the singular, and you kind of just oozed over to fill it, because at least you was a second person. But then, as you say, how do they... Manage the plural, and you guys, again, is very useful that way. Guys are you guys because it means plural people. How common is it outside of the United States? Do we find it in in British English and other English dialects today? It is surprisingly strong now in British English. I think that wasn't true even at the turn of the century. But I have a colleague who... Every now and then takes a bunch of students to England, and she mentioned that 20 years ago, in York, the birthplace of Guy Fox, nobody said you guys, but now, 20 years later, they say you guys. Mm-hmm. Did they get it from television? <laughs> Hard to tell. And I'm curious, too, within the United States, it seems that it has some competition. I mentioned earlier y'all being the uh, southern alternative. Right. It seems that over the past few decades, there's been some blurring of the lines between North and South. It seems that people in the South use you guys a lot more often, and it even seems that y'all has spread North a bit as well. Do you have any thoughts about the future of American English? Do you think that we will all be saying you guys in the future, that we'll have a decline in the use of y'all? Or do you think that the uh, the division is pretty much locked in place and there's always going to be that divide? Well, things have been kind of locked in place ever since the Civil War. The South lost the war, but kind of acquired its second-person plural distinctive pronoun. But just recently, um, I've heard also that you guys is used more often in the South than it used to be. And then the problem with y'all, it's a perfectly fine word, but it is very 
clearly linked to the South. So you're, you're free to say y'all, but then others will assume that you're a Southerner. And if you like that, that's fine. But if not, that's a problem. So I, yeah, I, I kind of think that y'all isn't going to spread very far, but I think it's beginning to weaken against you guys. I think you're probably right. And of course, I'm from the South, but I think that people still say y'all, but I think in urban areas, you're much more likely, in the South, in urban areas, you're much more likely to hear you guys. Uh, in rural areas, yeah. you're, you're more likely to hear y'all, though, though certainly both terms are in common usage. And there are others as well, Ewans and Yens, and there are other variations. But it'll be interesting. I, I, I tend to agree with you that y'all has a, a stigma outside of the South, which probably will prevent it from emerging as the uh, the alternative. Do you think at some point English will have a generally accepted dis way to distinguish singular you from plural you? In other words, do you think we're all going to settle on, on one of these options, or do you think we're just destined to have this um, you know, variation in our pronouns? Well, it's funny that uh, the, the changes still move very slowly, but yeah, I must say that at the moment, you guys is gaining frequency of youth in practically every English speaking country. And I think what we always look for is something that will not call attention to the word you're using if it's not a major word. That is, if you say uh, we or I or whatever, um, you don't want the person listening to think about this choice of the word we. That's just what we say. And I think that uh, just very recently that uh, you guys have become so prevalent that people don't notice it still, and that's the secret to success. I once wrote a book about how you can predict whether a new word is going to succeed, and I found that the most important characteristic is that it doesn't look new or sound new, so when somebody hears it, they say, oh, hmm. I, so I hadn't heard that before, but that must be what everybody's saying. And it does seem to be the kind of thing that people don't notice. They just, that's just what they say. Well, it's a fascinating story. And uh, again, the, the name of the book is The Life of Guy by Alan Metcalf. And uh, thank you very much for being on the podcast and uh, talking about the book. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.